Welcome back you guys, hope you're having an amazing day today. Today I'm doing something a little bit special and different for the News Daily video. Of course, you've been seeing his reports on Twitter and his articles as well. So I only felt right that I had the main man on himself in Mr. Ben Jacobs. So Ben, how are you doing today? I'm good. Great to be here. Season underway. Three weeks or so of the window remaining. And then from a transfers point of view, we can rest. But of course, it's going to be a busy season with a World Cup in between and lots of Chelsea players involved in that as well. Very, very busy and intense end to the year for sure. But uh, I think one of the first questions I wanted to ask you was, of course, from your perspective as a journalist from your end, what are some misconceptions maybe us fans can have behind your jobs and behind transfer stories in general? I think, first of all, that it's all funneled through Twitter. That's probably the most amusing one. I'm probably on Twitter for a maximum in terms of volume of output of 10% of the day and 90% is via broadcast work and sometimes written work as well. And I think during the window, everyone nails a colour to you because they feel like if you bring them good news, you're a fan. A lot of people ask me if I'm a Chelsea fan. I'm not. I'm a Leicester fan. Yeah. I was. A Chelsea fan in the famous 2-2 when Eden Hazard scored and Leicester won the Premier League. But other than that, not really a Chelsea fan. Really like the club, by the way. Definitely have a soft spot for them. But the impetus behind covering them more this window is largely down to the fact that CBS, American broadcaster, Chelsea now American-led consortium. So naturally, we're across it. And increasingly, the Premier League has got a huge stamp of American-led ownership or just Americans that have invested. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that pans out. I think sometimes we focus on money from elsewhere, particularly Manchester City and now Newcastle and Arsenal sponsorship from the Middle East. But the American billionaires, if you like, and groups are making pushes in European football, including in the Premier League, and they have done for quite some time. But maybe the biggest misconception is just how the transfer window works and how we as journalists operate. So I think that there's too much of a football manager or championship manager, depending on what game okay. you like or have played, mentality. And the window has a lot more finesse. So in itself, the transfer window is unreliable, which means that if you follow the blow by blow, then you're going to have to accept that something can be accurate today that changes tomorrow. And Jules Koundé is a great example of that. Yeah. I'm glad you know that Monchi came out and said very openly that he was, in inverted commas, sold to Chelsea because it effectively justifies a lot of the reporting, whereas usually we deal in sources and we can't say, well, this is what the source told me and they were either right at the time and something changed or they were misinformed. So we're constantly sort of the messengers open to potentially get all of the criticism and scrutiny if a very unpredictable window changes. And then number two is just that it's not a straight race to just bid in a transfer window. It's not linear. So therefore, yeah. the number is important, but so is the structure of a deal. A bid that is rejected can be denied by both the buyer and the seller. A buyer can say one price, the seller can say another because it's tactical. So let's look at Mark Kukurea, if we're trying to elaborate on a misconception, why would Chelsea put out there there's a full agreement and then it's 52.5 million and then the deal as far as Brighton are concerned 24 hours later is 62 million. The answer is because from Brighton's perspective, they want to make it very clear that that deal was not done and they've got the maximum value. And from Chelsea's perspective, regardless of as I understand it, the fact the fee is closer to what Brighton intimated of 62. And I think Chelsea are comfortable with that now. But why would that number 52.5 be put out there? Well, it's simply because Chelsea don't want a narrative where every player is higher because they've got to now go and do business with Leicester City. And 52.5 million for a player versus 62, first and foremost, shows that Chelsea are tougher negotiators. And second of all, it takes away from the negotiation table this notion that Chelsea are a club that might keep jumping up in seven to ten million incrementals overnight. So as a journalist, what we're trying to do is go to all sides and then put the puzzle together. Because if you only go to one, even if it's a very respectable source, there may be a narrative, an agenda, politics, they may be misinformed. And that's why you're constantly trying to get to multiple sources. So from my point of view, it's not always about being first because if you're constantly trying to be first, yeah. 
then at times something will change. It's about trying to provide that context and insight so people understand what is going on. And hopefully through a mixture of my broadcasting where you get these longer answers and Twitter where you get the threads which divide opinion, you will come out of this window understanding a bit more how a transfer works and therefore get a lot less frustrated as to why your club either isn't moving or are moving in a certain direction. I think that's going to provide a lot of uh, insight uh, to a lot of people watching this right now. Uh, I can imagine from your end sometimes, you know, of course, us fans are very emotional, reactive. We love our clubs. So if things aren't going in favour, of course, maybe we can lash out and we can be a bit negative. But uh, I do think that your answer now segues in very nicely to some of the latest dealings we're trying to get sorted and done for this window ends. And I guess one of the players of the moment right now, Wesley Fofana, from Leicester City. Seems like it's going to be a very difficult one. We got some insight and context from Brendan Rodgers suggesting that maybe now there's a valuation that originally wasn't being reported before. They were very adamant that he's not for sale. But now Rodgers is saying that until our valuation is met, which for me probably means if you pay us a world-class amount of money, a world record fee, you will get the player. But uh, of course, you know, for me, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, Leicester needs to get a replacement. I think sometimes we can, we can forget that yeah, it takes a lot of time to get players signed. It's a lot of scouting reports and let's have their own ambitions. They want to make sure that they can get the right players to help them achieve their goals for the season. And just selling and providing to bigger clubs doesn't really help out anything they're trying to do. So what is some of the latest lowdowns surrounding for Fana and whether there is a possibility that we may budge and pay more money to get this deal over the line? So as you've correctly said Leicester's perspective is that they will consider a world record fee similar to Harry Maguire and they've been pretty consistent in their valuation. Now valuation doesn't mean sale so a club valuing a player is not necessarily a 100% guarantee that they will sell a player for some of the reasons you've given including Leicester wanting to find a replacement if they are open to it. But the language has softened from Brendan Rodgers from not for sale and almost joking about even the possibility of either Fafana or James Madison to Newcastle leaving to not seeing our valuation met. And that's very different because one is we're not selling for by implication any price and the other is the valuation has not yet been reached which is far more of a clue that tells you that negotiations are ongoing. And at the time of recording, it could easily change on Friday as we're talking or even over the course of the weekend. Chelsea are considering if there is leeway. And that doesn't mean that they're waiting or preparing. They're trying to get the deal from two rejected bids, which were dismissed and they had to go in quite blind. There was not much back and forth to more through intermediaries and eventually directly of a genuine back and forth. Yeah. And once you get to a genuine back and forth, there's another misconception about the window. Things go quiet. And not only that, but they often turn verbal. And if they turn verbal, you may give a bid. It may get informally dismissed. And then as far as the buyer and the seller are concerned, it never happened. Because what you don't want to do is keep putting out there Third bid, rejected. Fourth bid, rejected. Both sides. Yeah. And Chelsea's point of view, it's because it sends a message to the rest of the market that they'll just keep coming back when they want a player. Yeah. And from Leicester's perspective, it sends a message if they're entertaining four bids, five bids, six bids, that of course they're willing to sell. Otherwise, they'd just be ignoring the bids and saying, go away, a little bit like Chelsea seemingly did when Amanda Broyo wanted to move originally to West Ham. And Chelsea, rather than rejecting it, kind of just left it on ice. Mm. So we're in a mystery part of negotiations through intermediaries, eventually direct to establish whether Chelsea are going to get their way, which is under 80 million and not quite a world record, or Leicester are going to get their way, which will either be a world record fee or just hanging on to the player. And obviously people listening will say, well, wait a minute, if Leicester's stance is entirely clear that they only want a world record, why are Chelsea wasting their time coming in under a world record? And part of that is to call the bluff and it's negotiation. Part of it is because if you start as low as Chelsea did around the 
60 odd million mark so potentially 25 million shy of what Leicester are looking for you can't be the club that in a day goes okay you said no to 60 here's 85 because once again it sends completely the wrong message to the market it's not how negotiation works so Chelsea's perspective a bit like Barcelona sometimes is they can actually look more at the structure than the number and when you hear 85 it's very easy to say why are we not just paying it that's a lot of money but 85 is not 85 85 is x your guaranteed fee and why your add-ons to make a potential total of 85. But what are those add-ons? And if you're a big club playing in Champions League, contending for Premier League, you've got a lot of variety on your add-ons. So you can put extreme permutations that you're prepared to pay the add-on for because you're going to succeed as a football club. So this is just a hypothetical, but let's just say Leicester say, okay, we want a hundred million. Chelsea could say, here's 60 and 40 in add-ons. That would never happen, but I'm purposefully creating an extreme yeah. to explain a point. Then fans would say a hundred million, but there's a big amount of that in add-ons. And add-on number one might be only if we win the Champions League. Add-on number two yeah. could be only if Fafana starts 30 or more Premier League games and so on. So then Leicester look at that 100 million and they say, well, how much of it are we actually going to get? Yes. Yeah. And then Chelsea say, we don't really mind offering it that high because if we do win the Champions League or he's that integral, it will be money well spent. Then at the other extreme, Chelsea could say, we're going to only give you 50 million plus 15 million in add-ons. And 50 million could be in one instalment, not four instalments. And the 15 million in add-ons could be, and again, I'm being farcically extreme here, but based upon Fafana playing one minute for Chelsea Football Club. And in the middle ground of those two extremes, this is how the negotiation works, because sometimes a club might be prepared to settle for less overall money with more preferable payment terms and add-ons. And this is the discussion taking place. And Chelsea are not, at the time of recording, pausing, waiting, thinking. When you hear the word preparing as a fan, you perhaps think, what are they doing? Is it just internal meetings? Are they putting it all down on paper? They know what Leicester want, but they don't. And preparing means talking two-way. It means yeah. sounding out the player's camp. It means working out whether you can use the player himself as leverage to go to the club and say, I want to leave or to agree personal terms. And obviously Rafinha did that with Leeds. He went there and yeah. said, I want to go in Barcelona, make the deal happen. So that is the sort of mystery process currently happening at the moment. And eventually it will culminate in a number and as importantly, a structure. And I don't anticipate that that not in the public domain or through the media will be particularly clear in the next 24 hours. But I would imagine Fafana will play against Arsenal and then early next week we will find out where we stand, whether it's third bid, whether they've gone back and forth with a variety of informal offers. And finally, Chelsea will touch upon a final number. And when they get there, Leicester's resolve will be tested. And my opinion, based on sources and the language Leicester are using, is still and has been long before it got to the stage it is now that if a certain number is hit which might be just under 70 yeah. but Leicester could try for 85 then the board part of Leicester will advance that and try and get a sale done because it's excellent value and Leicester need the funds but yeah. they will be very bullish and staunch and if Chelsea deep down and not prepared to pay a world record fee it is, as you started in your question by saying, going to be very difficult for Chelsea to get Wesley Fofana. The player wants the move. There is progress. And it's just a case now of letting the clubs go through what is a normal secretive process to try and get movement done without these figures being leaked in the public domain, because it's not good for the buyer or the seller this far into a negotiation in a third bid to have it out there. Because as I've already said, Chelsea don't want it in the market when they're talking about De Jong that they're prepared to drop 85 million. Leicester don't want it out there that despite what Brendan Rodgers is saying, and despite the fact they're playing for Fana, they actually are prepared to go back and forward. So this is all part of the tactics of the window. Yeah. But I still think that Chelsea are optimistic that they can progress this simply because Leicester are not 
ignoring them. They were dismissive with the first two bids, but that's different to being fully ignored. And now as they go back and forth looking to table what we believe to be a third bid, there is a little bit more engagement, which means that things are moving in Chelsea's direction. I guess for my next question, the club will probably understand that, OK, we're putting in a, a, all our eggs in one basket, potentially to try and get for fun over the line. You know, we don't have much time left now. We've been rejected by countless centre-backs. Things haven't completely worked in our favour throughout this window. So I'd imagine that there must be a few alternatives in terms of how can we continue to compete next season if we aren't able to get Fofana over the line. So are there any positions we're looking at or maybe other players from other leagues that could be guys to be Fofana replacements? Well, I just think that they've prioritised Fofana, which is no surprise because they had always put him on their radar under the old regime, but for 2023, along actually with Manchester United, who haven't chosen to enter the race at this point, which is no huge surprise because they don't have the budget of Chelsea or perhaps the desire. So PSG may be the only other club that may circle around Fafana between now and when the window closes or any move away from Leicester is determined. And we're at a stage of the window now where you get a lull last week of pre-season, first week of the season, because managers want to assess what they've got. It's incorrect that the best tactic is to bring in everyone by day one of pre-season or game one of the season. Otherwise, you might overbuy and actually a manager wants to see also how the season starts and then capitalise yeah. on the latter part of the window based on the chemistry they see or maybe an injury that is unexpected or a transfer that they didn't want to happen. And that's exactly why we have a window rather than just a week or two before pre-season starts or the football season begins. Other targets are reasonably well known at this stage. So Milan Skriniar is still a player that Thomas okay. Tuchel admires, but Inter have been quite firm in not wanting to sell him. The gamesmanship around that is that they're going to have to let someone go. And if they were to rank Bastoni, Martinez and Skriniar, Skriniar is the one that they are open to letting go, as proven by the fact that they negotiated with PSG. PSG yeah. were not prepared to pay the 70 million euros, but the player had agreed personal terms with PSG. So yeah. that's one to watch later in the window, as is Dumfries. Chelsea don't love the price tags on either of them. But the point is that yeah. as you get closer to the end of the window, you go back to a club that were bullish. And because deep down into need funds, they're going to have to let somebody go for money in all likelihood. And when it gets to that point where there's no time left, yeah. you've got better bargaining chips. And that's why if Chelsea either don't get Fafana or don't want to pay the money that is required to secure Fafana, you still might see them revisit what a lot of people think is an old target that is no longer a priority. And of course, Chelsea kind of did that with Jules Kunde, where they tried to sign him, sanctions, couldn't sign him, flash forwards, new regime, went to him at the beginning of the window, came to London, moved on to Nathan Ake, looked at Delete, brought in Koulibaly, went yeah. back to Jewel Kunde. And um, that is just how the window works. It's very cyclical. You never burn a bridge or 99 times out of 100. You don't say no definitively to somebody that you've explored simply because you may need to come back. And this is one of the challenges with Jules Kunde and how Chelsea perhaps handled it, that he felt unwanted by Chelsea yeah, comparative yeah. to Barcelona. Xavi said, hello, I'm the manager of Barcelona. I can give you a clear vision. Yeah. You're my top centre-back. Wait for us. We're moving. We're going to be more financially stable. We can afford you. We can register you, which some people will be smiling at right now, but they're moving in that direction after activating their fourth lever. But it was simple to Kunde, really. Barcelona want you, top centre back. Whereas Thomas Tuchel was talking about, you might play here, you might play there. We want you, we don't want you. Not Are you convincing. sure? Where's the fit in the team? Yeah. And then when they came back to him, no doubt that was a factor in Jules Kunde's thinking, even though, as has now been stated on record by Monchi, he was effectively sold, in inverted commas, to Chelsea Football Club. So this is kind of how the window works with other centre-backs as well, that the landscape that fans see through the media is never reflective because of the secrecy through which sporting directors and football departments work. So just because a fan thinks the narrative is it's Fafana, 
we're prioritizing him. It's big money. It's 85 million. That's not strictly true because the club that want a position are always spinning multiple plates. So they will have a backup. They will have an alternative. They will have a low budget option. They'll have a young option. They'll have an established option. They'll have a last minute option. They might have a loan option. And they'll certainly have options for January and next summer that they're all working on concurrently. So just because the media points you in a direction that it's all Fana, all De Jong, all Aubameyang, Chelsea every single day during the window uh, probably simultaneously directly or through intermediaries and then with agents to talking to upwards of 15 players young old now next window year in advance and therefore there will be a plan but i think because of the new ownership there's maybe a little bit more unease because everyone knew how marina abramovich worked and yeah. nobody's quite sure how Bowley operates, especially given he's in an interim role.